63 years ago, back in 1955, the year some of us may dimly remember from distant childhood, <laughs> Theodor Wiesengrund Adorno wrote an essay whose standard English translation has a translation, The Aging of the New Music. That's in 1955. Just what Adorno meant by new music and why it had to have a definite article in the English translation, I'd like us to consider in a moment when we look first at why Adorno felt this music to be aging and already aging by 1955, when the works he mentions as pioneer manifestations of the new music, Dex Altenberg, Leader, and The Rite of Spring, had been created only 40 years or so before. In his view, those works sprang from necessities both artistic and social. On the artistic side, the possibilities of the language rooted in major minor totality were near exhaustion, and it's become a commonplace since Adorno to say we can hear that exhaustion in, most notably, the symphonies of Gustav Mahler. Composers either had to pile on more distance and so break through the dam of tonality, as Beck did, or, like Stravinsky, shoot off in another direction. In either case, the pressure for change must have been irresistible perhaps exhilarating, perhaps scary. And in either case, the social effect, or at least the social analogy, was momentous. Berg's Altenberg Lieder and Stravinsky's Rite of Spring were not made for a pleasant evening out in the concert hall or theatre. They were made to challenge the very audience that would hear them and the very system within which they would be heard. And as we know, they were successful in that challenge in the measure that their first performances, both mounted in 1913, created uproar among the audience. Contrast that with the situation in 1955. The radical innovations associated at that time with Pierre Boulez, Karlheinz Stockhausen, Luigi Nono, did not emerge out of a musical language that had been long in operation and was now in decay. They were prompted, rather, by a conviction that the revolutions of four decades before did not go far enough that new music, to use that term, had lapsed into routine, as represented by, say, the later neoclassical works of Stravinsky. To be sure, there was a social aspect to this conviction, an important one. For those young composers in 1955, the social upheaval that seemed to have been presaged by the first round of modernism, that of Beck, Stravinsky, and the rest, had failed to take place. One stack of empires, monarchical, had simply been replaced by another, fascist. And in the one country that had witnessed the social political overhaul, the Soviet Union, the outcome had been a repressive autocracy more sinister than that of the Tsars. In similar fashion, though early 20th century modernism had had a huge impact on composers through the 1920s, 30s and 40s, very little of the music had become installed in the living repertory. It was as if you have a revolution and then things go on as before. The young composers of 1955 wanted, rather, to revolutionize the nature of revolutions, wanted to create music that would be resolutely different and that would be in synergy with a completely new kind of society. But as Adorno was pointing out in his essay, that's not what was happening. New music was being sidelined even more emphatically than before with the establishment of concert series and events specifically for it, the kind of thing we were very familiar with. Adorno spoke of music festival music, referring to the great German festivals of new music, notably Donau Eschingen, at which the most audacious works were annually presented. Composers were no longer confronting or able to confront the general audience that went to orchestral concerts. Moving to today, we may feel that not much has changed. One thing that has changed, however, is the number of composers at work. When Adorno was writing, a listener familiar with the music of, say, 20 composers could claim to be an expert. Since then, because of the compelling appeal of the works of that generation born in the 1920s, Boulez, Stockhausen, and Nono, but also Ligeti, Courtenard, Berio, Zenicus, the compelling appeal that is not to the public at large, but to young people setting out to be composers themselves, we have now witnessed three generations rushing through the doors, those senior composers, were opening around the time of Adorno's essay. The internet documentation supported by Ircam in Paris keeps track of around 2,000, and there must be several times that number who could claim to be professional composers. Organizations such as BCMG were, of course, set up precisely to monitor and present the abundance we have of new music. 
Such organizations were also set up, however, to keep alive older works that have a bearing on, that help to define what's being written today, but that show us, too, how our notion of new music is, to use Adorno's term, aging. Over the last couple of seasons, BCMG has been concentrating on music written this century, demonstrating a salutary readiness to make the C in their name really stand for contemporary. <clears throat> By the way, we lost this term some while back. If you go to the Barbican website and use the contemporary music filter, you'll be offered an array of improvising musicians, not new work by Brian Furnio or George Benjamin. But this gesture on the part of BCMG is valuable precisely because it goes against the grain of our, music, of our new music culture generally. What's happened in the last few decades is that new music has become fully a category. We have new music festivals, as Adorno did, but their remit now goes back not just to the last few months, but to the last few decades. The same goes for new music ensembles, with the honourable exception just now of BCMG. And this seems inevitable. For if our new music groups are not going to put on, say, Le Matteau Sommet, a work now more than 60 years old, it's not at all clear who is. Thus we have the paradox of new music going back to the time of the Suez Crisis, perhaps to that of the general strike, if we want to include Verres' hyperprism, again, a work having no place except in the repertory of our new music ensembles, and a work that will soon be a hundred years old. New music, then, no longer has to be new. A music that is new, that of David Matthews, for example, not to mention Sir Carl Jenkins, may very well not be new music. For new music now, more than a category, is almost a genre. You can be a new music composer, just as you can be a folk music composer. You can be a new music composer, or you can not be. Like any other genre, new music has its classics, among which we surely all want to include the works by Boulez and Verres I just mentioned. Compounding the paradox, though, mighty few of those classics are new. Indeed, nearly all of them are half a century old and more. We could probably all agree here on a few classics of the 1970s, maybe Steve Reich's Music for 18 Musicians, or Gérard Grise's Les Espaces Acoustiques, but if we ask ourselves, where are the classics of the 1980s, or the 1990s, or of the first decade of this century, we may have more problems. I might want to argue that Rebecca Saunders' Murmurs, which BCMG will be playing later this season, is a 21st century classic, a piece that has all the hallmarks of the classic, and that it thoroughly embodies some of the composer's most fundamental and distinctive qualities and objectives, opens new musical possibilities, and speaks for its time. But I know this is hardly more than a personal view, not because the musical landscape is crowded with other contenders, but on the contrary, because it's not, because we're not even looking for classics in that sense, because the mechanisms by which classics come to be established as such are failing or have failed. We don't have the opportunity to hear murmurs or any work like it in different performances, to read varying approaches to it, to recognize its impact and influence within the larger culture. Another symptom of the same musical situation is that evolution in styles has become less detectable, if it exists at all. One of the things that impresses me about Murmurs, one of the things that would help make it a classic, is that it, as I said, it speaks for its time, belongs decisively to its period, not so much musically, as in relating to atmospheres of uncertainty and secrecy in which we live. Where more purely musical matters are concerned, it would be very hard to say that this is a work distinctly of 2009 and not 1999 or even 1989. For those things that mark a period across the range in the 1950s from, for instance, Stravinsky to Stockhausen, we have today no equivalent, partly because this <coughs> Partly because there are so very many composers at work, with almost no agreement as to means, ideals, or aims, but also because those composers are working largely in ignorance of one another. The result is an extremely busy stasis, a stasis such as Western classical music has not experienced since maybe the first half of the 17th century, when Monteverdi was able to maintain a career as an opera composer for more than 30 years while keeping pretty much the same style. In general life, a lot has changed in the last 30 years, the period since the era of Mikhail Gorbachev and Margaret Thatcher. 
since when cell phones with bulky machines ostentatiously wielded by a few fast-track bankers, since when personal computers were expensive toys, and since when there was no internet. In music, this last innovation has certainly made a colossal difference to the availability of music, and to new music in particular. But its effect on composition has been slight. That could alter. After all, sound recording had been going for several decades before Pierre Schaeffer found a creative use for it with the first music concrete compositions in 1948. And we have glimmerings of at least one possibility for internet music going back also to the 1940s when Verre started imagining a piece that would bring together performers in different parts of the globe. As it stands though, compositional means and styles have not been much affected by the internet revolution or anything else in the last three decades. Just now I describe this period, our period, our more or less present, as one of busy stasis, a stasis that's not that of the same things going on the same way all the time, but rather of different things going on the same way all the time, of new pieces hectically succeeding one another almost before the ink is dry on the score, or I should say the electrons at rest on the PDF document. Apart from the totem ancestors I mentioned before, the new music classics, nearly all several decades old, and by composers who've left this hurtling planet since the beginning of the present century, we live musically in a throwaway culture, a culture that still has a keen appetite for the new, but not much interest in what happened yesterday or the day before. Everything, <clears throat> everything which is meant by the term classical, but important works go on being valued while being constantly redefined by performance and interpretation, is confounded. To close somewhere near Adorno's territory, if we might be inclined to doubt the relevance of music to the wider world, or vice versa, we should consider this, how the area in which we come together here tonight, the area of new music, so closely resembles the larger world in which we find ourselves, a world insensitive to value, grasping at novelty as it feverishly shovels out discards. <laughs>